Yeah, so thank you all for coming. Um, this presentation is on a project that we did over the summer um, where we wanted to use new digital techniques at Creswell Crags to kind of reevaluate and reassess the art there. So, um, yeah, we're just going to keep, uh, we'll focus on that and some of our initial results from that project uh, that we did over the summer. Yeah. So just a quick overview of what we'll talk about today. I'll first give a bit of an introduction and background to Creswell Crags for if anyone's not familiar with the site um, and then the digital techniques um, that we used. Uh, and then Barbara will take over and talk about some of the methods and the results that we had. And then um, I'll finally conclude with some of the initial interpretations and conclusions that came out of our research. Yeah. So um, Creswell Crags is a really unique site. It's the um, only example of Paleolithic parietal art that we have, no worries, in the UK. Um, it's located in the East Midlands, on the, uh, exactly on the Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire border. So one side of the crags is Nottinghamshire, one side is Derbyshire. Um, and the site itself features um, four caves that have Paleolithic deposits, um, Church Hole Cave, Pinhole Cave, Robin Hood Cave and Mother Grundy's. And three of these seem to have engraved depictions from the Paleolithic. So that's Church Hole, Robin Hood and Mother Grundy's. So this is where we kind of focused our fieldwork um, during the summer. Yeah. So we really wanted to kind of use some new digital techniques um, to understand this site. So the art of Creswell Crags was initially discovered in 2003 um, with a kind of big bug book publication coming out in 2007. But since the, the cave art itself hasn't really been subject to much academic study, I mean, there's a big kind of... Uh, museum there now and it's open to the public and there's lots of engagement with the site in that sense but um, in terms of academic studies there's been kind of very little really of the art itself so what we wanted to do is try and use these new digital techniques to see if we could kind of reveal any new insights um, now that we have uh, some more digital techniques that we can use in studying rock art and also to kind of um, appreciate more in-depth insights into the art itself so um, in the last two decades, I think that these digital techniques such as 3D modeling have really allowed us to appreciate the materiality of uh, Paleolithic art rather than just presenting it as this kind of static 2D image. We can kind of engage with it a little bit more and appreciate how the texture and topography and spatial placement of the art really kind of affects its um, understanding and interpretation. Um, and I, I think that these kind of allow us then to capture those more sensory aspects of Paleolithic art. Yeah. So um, our study kind of initially started with just a, a fairly standard observational uh, in-depth analysis of the art itself. We use cold raking light sources to really pick up the um, engraved depictions on the walls. Um, kind of following what had been recorded in 2003 and seeing whether if we could identify the same depictions and also um, if we could see any additional depictions. Um, and of course, playing co close uh, attention to kind of the, um, the profile of the engraved uh, lines, the erosion, patination and everything um, for those depictions that we felt hadn't been recorded before. And then took high resolution images of each depiction. Yeah. Um, and then we used a couple of modeling methods then to really record those kind of more material aspects of the um, engraved depictions. So the first is RTI or reflectance transformation imaging. So this is uh, a process that produces almost a 2.5D model where you can manipulate the light and really pick out those um, more finer details of the depictions. Um, so this uh, these models are produced by having a, a static camera in front of the object that you want to record, uh, a reflective ball, um, and then uh, one singular light source. And you take a series of images um, with the light source at different positions. And that then builds a model where you can manipulate the light continuously to then pick out these details. So there are important kind of procedures to follow there in terms of where you position your camera. It has to be at a right angle to the object that you want to record, where you're positioning the reflective sphere, 
and also the light source should be kept at a consistent distance. And you can imagine in a cave that is quite difficult to kind of manipulate and um, keep consistent, which is what we found um, during our field work. Yeah. So this is kind of the, the model that you end up with. Um, hopefully you can sort of pick out this engraved depiction here. Um, and as I mentioned, there's kind of some challenges with using this approach in caves, especially where stabilizing the camera on kind of unstable surfaces, ensuring that kind of those distances that remain the same are really difficult things that you have to kind of play around with. And we had, it was kind of a technical problem that we had to keep uh, adjusting how we were placing our equipment in the caves. Yeah, we use, yeah, so we got creative with seats and boxes and yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think now I'll pass over to Barbara. Um, yeah, so thank you, Izzy, for that introduction. So um, yeah, in addition to our two and a half of the um, RTI models, we also captured more traditional photogrammetry, um, photogrammetry models, um, which actually have a longer history of use um, within morphological investigations. So photogrammetry encapsulates the art of extracting 3D information from photographs. Um, and this is done through taking pictures which consistently overlap each other uh, over entire surface. So the overlap of images is, um, is key. Um, as, um, yeah, as most of you probably know, uh, photogrammetry software like, um, like Edges of Metashape uses algorithms um, to decipher information such as camera angles, um, but also locations as well as, um, as pixel matches um, within consecutive images. Um, so as an example of such a 3D model, you can see um, over there, these two, um, clearly revealing the location of marks within uh, a wide undulated um, uh, surface. So in the two videos um, here, you can see me here taking pictures and I think it's Izzy lighting. Um, um, so yeah, you can see the, the, the detailed amount of camera and light um, uh, positions in order to capture enough data. Um, and yeah, here the general topography of the cave gets um, gets captured nicely um, through the means of, in this case, close uh, close range um, photogrammetry, which is basically very close up version uh, version of uh, of images. Hold on. Yeah. Um, so by using high resolution uh, photographs, photogrammetry, and uh, an RTI. Uh, models, we inform digital tracings uh, of the engravings, as you can see here. And this is the bison. Um, so you literally, yeah, you can trace the engravings with, um, with a digital pencil. And in this case, we used um, the software, the program Krita, but you can also do this um, with, yeah, with Photoshop. Um, so during our field work, uh, we recorded 14 out of 23 um, depictions from the 2003 study. Um, and we identified two uh, new depictions, and you can see those here. This is like a, a female, female shape, uh, potentially, and then several lines over here. Um, we produced 12 models, uh, which um, eight were photogrammetric and four RTI. And as, yeah, as, as you already mentioned, um, yeah, the RTI models show significantly more detail um, than the 3D um, models. Um, however, in several cases, it was not yeah, it was not possible to produce the RTI models because either, you know, we couldn't get high enough um, up to the panel um, and yeah, because of the difficulty with positioning um, the equipment. So here you can see two um, additional female or bird-like shapes. Um, and these were in 2003 were um, uranium thorium data to around a minimum age of 14,500 years. Um, so on the right, you can see yeah, a collection of lines. Some are very deeply engraved, some are more shallow. Um, and yeah, these, these were identified in 2003 as, as females or, or bird-like shapes. But as you can see, it's quite difficult to really, um, yeah, to really see what is depicted here. Um, and then on the, on the right, you can see some more shapes that could potentially be female shapes um, as well. Um, but Izzy will discuss this more in the 
interpretation. And here um, you can see a tracing from 2003 in which you can see a, a stag, a deer, several horses. Um, and um, yeah, after, after we did um, RTI, um, we were actually only, only able to identify the stag. So there was no sign of any of the other um, images. <laughs> um, so yeah, you can see with this more accurate um, method of RTI, um, yeah, you can actually re reveal also that some things are not there. Um, so yeah, and the the, sta the lines uh, on the lower part here were also uranium thorium dates. It's um, at thirteen thousand years. Uh, so this actually confirmed the Paleolithic dates of these um, of these um, engravings. Um, and this panel was supposed to have a horse um, or a bison depicted. Um, however, neither RTI nor photogrammetry could reveal there was anything engraved here. Um, and, uh, yeah. and there was another, um, well, I can't remember, was it a, a horse or a bison as well near the entrance? And we looked, I mean, we looked, we did models, but we could not see even a single engraved line there. So, yeah. And then uh, we have the bird. So um, other examples show sometimes that the, the natural shapes of the rock um, were enhanced. So here you can see um, a bird-like shape. And in the, the topmost uh, left, it kind of looks like the whole image is engraved. But then if you zoom in and, in solid view, um, which is a future in Agile Soft in which you can kind of strip the um, the structure, um, uh, leaving only the depths of the surface. Um, and then it becomes evident that it's actually only the top part of the bird that has been engraved. And the rest is, uh, is natural. And you can actually see it on this side here as well. There, there's more shapes um, that appear to be natural. So they enhance the natural shape of, uh, of the rock to make it look like a, like a bird. So at Robin Hood's cave, um, we identified all depictions that were described in the 2003 study. Um, we found three new possible Paleolithic um, depictions. Um, six models were produced, of which one was RTI, and that was only the lowest part of a panel, because again, we had problems um, yeah. <laughs> getting higher up. Um, yeah, so to the right, you can see a, a vulva shape, over here and several lines, and this is actually a close-up of a, of a larger panel, which is panel one. Um, you can see the vulva shape here, and then there's um, these lines here that kind of follow the crack in the wall, um, were identified by us um, during our, um, our investigation. Um, yeah, and the panel um, was recorded in 2003, uh, the upper part mostly, and then the calcite you can see over here was also um, uranium thorium dated, um, providing a minimum age of 8,000 um, years. So, of course, it means that it could be a lot older as well. Um, and then on the right, we see some newly discovered engravings of a partial triangle um, and then also several deeply engraved lines um, below it. And then finally, uh, we investigated Mother Grunley Mother Gundy's parlor, um, where we discovered, uh, we also tried RTI here, but this was the, I think this was the most challenging because it was very high up. And I think the, it was this, yeah, it was very narrow. So we wouldn't, e yeah, you need to kind of place the little ball in front of it. And there wasn't even enough space to, to place the camera and the, and the ball. So, um, so here we discovered also some, um, some engraved lines. Um, and remarkable here is that you can see that in some cases, um, actually, especially when there's shallow lines, um, the structured view of Agisoft shows them the lines much better than the solid view. As you can see, there's a lot of differences in the, in the tracings between um, the two. Um, and it, it, yeah, it, it kind of also illustrates that um, even with Agisoft, you kind of have to keep both um, both next to each other to kind of interpret what you're seeing, because uh, a lot of the time, um, yeah, it can be quite subjective. So. Um, now back to Izzy. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think really what's important from all of these models that we produce is it allows us to kind of get a little bit deeper into the interpretations of the art at this site. And I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to run through this quite quickly and you can save questions maybe for the discussion later. So um, in terms of these new depictions of potential either bird or female engravings in Church Hole Cave, there are 
are two panels that also show these kind of engravings. Um, and what's been discussed previously is the orientation of these particular depictions. So um, one interpretation is that these are representing uh, females, like the Gunnarsdorf females, and very stylized. So this is potentially then incorrect orientation at the entrance of the passage. And the, uh, what's been proposed previously is the floor height um, as you get deeper into the passage where these two depictions are placed. Um, would have kind of constrained your bodily orientation and you would have maybe had to then engrave almost upside down for these depictions. But what's interesting is that these particular new depictions are then in a horizontal orientation. So it kind of raises these deeper questions about um, what are the bodily positions and process of, produ of producing these engravings um, within this passage. So these are actually kind of relatively positioned lower than the engravings here. So is this representing someone lying on their back and kind of producing these shallower engravings because they can't quite kind of orientate their body properly or something else. Yep, next slide. <laughs> um, and uh, aspects of our research also allowed us to clarify the forms of certain depictions. So through RTI models, we were able to identify that these um, inverted triangles or vulva depictions actually have this closed feature, which then allows us to compare this to um, similar kind of mid Magdalenian or final Magdalenian um, depictions elsewhere across Europe. So it allows us to kind of reveal those more uh, cultural connections then with um, European Paleolithic art elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and similarly, by using kind of these 3D modeling techniques, we can also demonstrate how um, the depictions are kind of utilizing the natural topography of the cable. So Barbara mentioned this a little bit with the bird depiction, how they're utilizing the natural forms that are available. And it seems here with this bison depiction, the kind of shoulder of the bison here is enhancing kind of a, a, a convexity. Yep, that's the right one. Um, in the natural relief of the cable to kind of give it that extra dimension. Yeah, next slide. So to very quickly conclude, I'm sorry, um, we feel that by integrating these digital techniques, it allows you to augment traditional fieldwork observations, facilitating these identification of new depictions um, and allowing you to draw these more in-depth comparisons um, between cave art from one site and elsewhere. And also, we just want to emphasise that we want we're creating an open access repository for all our models. So very shortly, we're hopefully going to have these available either on the Bradshaw Foundation website or the Creswell Crags website so that future researchers can download these and kind of challenge our observations as well. So thank you all very much for listening. Um, yeah, here are our details. <laughs>